Thank you. So there are three types of uh, lies. There are lies, there are big lies, and uh, there are statistics. <laughs> so as a starting point, uh, um, please consider the following statement. In the Vatican City, there are 5.88 popes per square mile. <laughs> this is not a lie. Okay, this is correct. The number is correct. And uh, I've never been in the Vatican City, but I kind of expect one pope to be there at a time. So something fun. Two you, popes. Two popes? The others, the, the old ones are alive. Yeah. Oh, well, sometimes it happens, yeah. But in principle, you know, in the kind of in the long term, you expect one pope at a time, even if you don't know much about the Vatican like me. Uh, so something fun is going on, and that's the idea for the talk. So we are exposed to uh, statistics in uh, everyday life, and not all of us have uh, advanced uh, degrees in, uh, in maths and whatnot. So this talk will be about uh, the use and misuse and abuse of statistics in everyday life, and essentially how not to lie with statistics. So the idea is uh, we're not talking about uh, Python or any advanced uh, statistical modeling or machine learning. We just want to be uh, sort of good citizens and. Uh, be prepared for uh, when uh, we are exposed to statistics and uh, we want to understand what's going on. Uh, we're not talking about Python, but just out of curiosity, how many of you are Python users at uh, different levels, beginners, experts, being exposed to Python, more or less, almost everybody? A few people too tired to raise the hands, but you know, almost everybody. Everybody feeling okay? Anybody feeling sick? Nobody sick? So. There you go. Statistics are telling us that uh, knowing some Python is uh, positive for your uh, well-being. <laughs> so there are, with these statements, there are two problems, one that we'll uh, discuss later, and the other one is the uh, kind of the starting point, which is uh, correlation. So correlation is an informal definition. Uh, it's already in the name, right? Correlation is uh, some sort of relationship connection between two things, two events, two variables. A bit more formally, we also want to measure the strength of, the, um, of this relationship, of the association between two variables. When we talk about correlation, the kind of simplest thing that comes to mind is linear correlation. It's just easier to visualize, right? Linear correlation, uh, when uh, one variable is uh, increasing, the other variable is uh, either increasing or decreasing following some sort of line. So you see the line here, therefore linear correlation. And we talk about positive or negative linear correlation, but the idea is one variable moves and the other variable follows the line. To give you a more concrete example, let's say the temperature goes up and uh, if you have uh, uh, an ice cream uh, shop, also your revenue will go up, right? Nice weather, you sell more ice cream. And uh, the way we look at this, uh, there's kind of a, you know, a cause and effect. Uh, nice weather, therefore, we eat more ice cream. But in the general case, uh, that's not always uh, true, right? Maybe you heard the expression, correlation does not imply causation. So again, on the ice cream example, we can see how there is uh, a correlation between uh, revenue for ice cream sales and the number of people who died uh, drowning. So what's going on here? Is ice cream really the killer? To understand uh, uh, what's going on here, we need to introduce the notion of a uh, lurking variable. A lurking variable is uh, a variable that we don't really see, but it's there, it's kind of looking at us, so it's lurking. Uh, back to our ice cream example, that would be temperature, of course. So nice weather, more people eat ice cream, so revenue goes up. But also nice weather, more people go swimming, and therefore more people die uh, drowning, unfortunately. So there is a third variable here explaining the connection between ice cream and uh, drowning. Uh, one more example. Often uh, people observe that uh, whenever there is uh, some sort of fire accident, if you deploy more firefighters on the scene, you will also have uh, uh, bigger damage. Right? So from a decision-making point of view, it makes sense to say, okay, let's deploy less people, less firefighters, so the damage will be smaller. Of course, uh, you know, big fire means you have to deploy more firefighters, so big fire also uh, has a higher chance of causing a bigger damage. 
So that's the idea. There is the file severity behind the scenes to describe the relationship. So long story short, uh, if we try to explain correlation and causation, uh, it can be complicated, right? So here I'm kind of summarizing all the options. Either there is actually a cause, so A causes B or the other way around, or maybe the two variables A and B together explain something else, or something else is the cause of A and B, or maybe there is a transitive relationship, A causes something and something causes B, or maybe there is just no connection between the two variables. Uh, a few examples of uh, things that correlate. Uh, so the number of movies uh, with Nicolas Cage and number of people who drown into a pool. So Nicolas Cage, please don't do other movies. <laughs> the consumption of uh, margarine uh, and the number of murders by blunt object. So margarine makes you kind of more uh, nervous, more aggressive. Facebook, it's quite easy nowadays to blame Facebook for everything, uh, but uh, Facebook, number of users of Facebook and the national debt of Greece, they kind of go together. So <laughs> more users of Facebook, uh, bigger problems for uh, Greece. Number of users of Microsoft <laughs> Internet Explorer. and uh, murder rate, yeah. Again, numbers are true. There is no lie here. Finally, my favorite one is the uh, consumption of chocolate and uh, the number of Nobel Prizes. <laughs> so you see how you know every country is kind of following the line. The more chocolate you consume, the more Nobel Prizes you win. And uh, well, there are a couple of outliers, Sweden, having more Nobel Prizes than expected. Who knows why? And uh, Germany, <laughs> Germany not very efficient at uh, converting chocolate into Nobel Prizes. <laughs> so that was correlation. Uh, now moving on to the next topic. So what's going on when you uh, analyze data and you sort of slice and dice uh, your data set? This is also called the Simpsons paradox that was uh, first observed and described by somebody not called the Simpson, but still we call it Simpsons paradox. And uh, I'm going to use uh, a textbook example here to describe the Simpsons paradox. That's uh, from uh, from Wikipedia, essentially. If you look at the number of admissions at uh, in grad school uh, in the 70s for the University of California, and then you group uh, by men and women, you see that there is a difference. Uh, in the proportion between uh, men being admitted and uh, women. So the difference is uh, kind of big enough to ask uh, the question, is there some sort of gender bias going on? Now, the numbers here are correct. Uh, if you start digging into the details and you break down the numbers uh, per department, so each line is a different department, A, B, C, D, and so on, what you observe is something funny. So you see how uh, for many departments, the proportion of women being accepted is actually higher compared to the proportion of men. So these numbers are also correct and they're kind of telling the opposite story. If you look at the absolute numbers, you see how uh, men tend to apply for departments with uh, a higher admission rate. And on the other side, uh, women tend to apply for departments with a lower admission rate. So essentially, well, one could say maybe women are applying to more competitive departments. Uh, but long story short, uh, you will observe this kind of uh, paradox. Whenever you have uh, a data set and you kind of slice and dice the data set and your classes, your groups, uh, will not be equally distributed. So the distribution across departments is highly skewed, and uh, that's why you observe this kind of phenomenon, Simpson's paradox. So all the numbers are correct. If you have uh, some sort of agenda to push, you can choose one or the other, right? The next type of uh, lies here is related to uh, sampling bias. So sampling bias, you know, when I asked uh, uh, do you know Python? Uh, well, we are at a Python uh, conference, so we kind of expect a lot of people to know Python. And uh, I shouldn't use this information to draw conclusions on, uh, on a bigger population, right? So back to the uh, terminology sampling. The idea of sampling is uh, selecting a subset of uh, individuals 
with the purpose of doing uh, some sort of estimate on a bigger population. Uh, sometimes you cannot do estimates on the full population, right? So you need to build some sort of model and uh, you do sampling. In the age of big data, uh, that's what, uh, what you have to do. On the other side, bias. Um, in everyday language, uh, we have maybe a bit of a negative connotation to the word bias. We associate bias, bias with uh, prejudice. Um, in science, maybe there is not explicitly uh, this kind of negative connotation, so a bias is just a systematic error. We don't know if the error was on purpose or, or by accident. So sampling bias is simply a, an error done during uh, your sampling process. And again, uh, a bit of a textbook uh, example, Dewey defeats Truman. That's Truman, uh, president of the US, I'm gonna say 1940 something, 48 maybe. That's in the morning uh, when he became president, so he was elected, and he's waving a newspaper that says, uh, Dewey defeats Truman, so the newspaper says the opposite. And you see the, the guy is smiling. So, what happened here is uh, the newspaper put the wrong uh, headline because uh, they ran some sort of survey, a phone survey precisely, they phone people and they, they ask uh, who are you gonna vote? And remember this is 1948, uh, so not everybody has a phone. So the kind of people with a phone at the time who are actually readers of the Chicago Tribune were all uh, Republicans essentially, and uh, they were voting for Dewey. So the survey was uh, clearly biased. Therefore, uh, the wrong uh, headline. As a special case uh, of uh, sampling bias, there is also survivorship bias that was uh, mentioned uh, yesterday in the keynote. So survivorship bias is when you focus only on the lottery winners and you forget about all the people who bought a ticket but didn't win the lottery. And uh, also when you hear all the stories of success, uh, you know, all the billionaires, Bill Gates, uh, Jobs and so on, they are all uh, college uh, dropouts. Uh, so should you quit studying and become a billionaire? Well, you're old enough to make your own decisions. <laughs> I didn't quit uh, studying and I'm not a billionaire. <laughs> the next uh, segment is on data visualization. So data visualization in uh, data analytics in general is, very, is a very powerful tool. Uh, you can essentially uh, use one image to describe uh, uh, a, complex, a com very complex uh, kind of concept. And also, as a data analyst, uh, when you're doing uh, data analytics, you still need to use visualization to understand what's going on with your data. So here you have, for example, four different data sets, and uh, they all share uh, some summary statistics. So the average X, the average Y, they're all the same. The variance will be the same, some sort of correlation coefficient will be the same. So if you only look at the summary statistics of uh, a data set, maybe you don't fully understand uh, what the data set is about. Once you plot it, you will see how these data sets are really uh, very different. And again, this is a bit of a textbook example, but the idea is uh, data visualization gives you better insights to your data set. But also data visualization is used to communicate uh, right, to the broader public. If there is a complex uh, kind of uh, topic, you can use just an image to, uh, to communicate. So here there was uh, some sort of a core decision and uh, a newspaper just wanted to uh, showcase how different parties support uh, the, this particular core decision. And you see how the bar for Democrat is much, much higher, almost three times bigger than, than the other. So it looks like Democrats are very much in favor of uh, this particular decision. But then something funny is going on. Uh, the uh, vertical axis is starting not from zero, but from 50. So once you normalize everything, so the one on the right is the correct uh, version of the plot, you see how, yes, the bars are different, but the difference is not so huge. So maybe the story on the right seems less, uh, less interesting from a newspaper point of view. More visualization, so guns in the US, uh, very hot topic. So in uh, 2005 in Florida, they introduced uh, uh, what is called the Stand Your Ground uh, law. And here you see how when, I, when the law is introduced, there is a kind of a drop in, uh, in this graph that is representing the number of uh, murders committed using firearms. 
again, something funny going on, right? For some reason, the vertical axis starts from uh, 1,000 and goes uh, down. So <laughs> once you fix the, the plot, reality is literally upside down, OK? So this was published in the Business Insider. Uh, the original visualization was by Reuters. One more example. This is from the Italian uh, public service. Uh, and uh, essentially, the, this is a uh, talk show, TV uh, political talk show. Um, they did a survey, and they asked whether the government is friends with the lobbies. And of course, being friends with the lobbies is bad. So uh, if you don't like the results, you take 44%, which is a big slice of the cake, and you squeeze it into a tiny slice. And uh, I always thought, you know, in Italy, we are kind of world champions at this. Uh, but then I moved to the UK uh, about 10 years ago, and I realized things are not any better anyway. So some uh, political leaflets. Uh, in the UK, just to, to give some context, the, uh, the system is called uh, first past the post. So essentially, the narrative from the main parties is always don't vote for the small guys because the vote is going to be wasted. You should vote for us. So it's always kind of a, a race between two main parties. Here, a leaflet by the uh, conservative parties in blue. They say, don't waste your vote on the UK people. You should vote for us because we're going to be ahead anyway. And uh, it's funny how uh, the bar for the Labour Party, which is 42% rather than 32, is uh, smaller than the one for the Conservatives. So kind of giving a, a message that they are ahead. But they're not the only ones doing uh, this kind of uh, little tricks. So this one is from the Lib Dems uh, for some sort of local election, I think. And you see how the yellow bar for the Lib, Lib Dems is uh, kind of catching up with the, with the labor, you know, almost there. We need your help. We need just a couple more votes. <laughs> but then when you normalize it, you see there is a huge difference. So it's kind of like, why bother? <laughs> now to complete the picture with the, all the main parties. So again, uh, the story is uh, going to be a race between two horses. This is from the laborers, and they say, don't waste your vote. Uh, with these small yellow guys, vote for us. And uh, it is indeed uh, a race between two horses, but they completely forgot about uh, the Green Party, which is the one uh, competing for that particular uh, uh, constituency. So yeah, uh, kind of just to be a little bit politically correct, uh, you see how all the parties are kind of doing the same, uh, the same little tricks. OK, so that, that was the idea on uh, data visualization. You can use visualization to kind of convey any kind of message. Now, for a slightly more advanced uh, kind of topic, uh, statistical significance. Statistical significance is one of the most uh, unfortunate names in, uh, in science, probably, because uh, in uh, everyday language, when we say something is significant, uh, we kind of assume it's also important. Right. So often statistical significance is used uh, as a synonym for importance, but it's not really the case. So when we talk about statistically significant results, we simply mean that we are kind of sure about the results. So the results are more re reliable. They're not by chance. But statistically significant results are not about how big the results are. It's not about how important the results are. And it's not about how useful they are. So they're simply statistically significant. So we're just more sure about the results. And that's, uh, and that's it. Uh, a notion uh, connected to statistical significance is uh, the uh, p-values. And uh, so p-values, when I was a student, it was one of the most uh, confusing uh, topic for me. Uh, and I wish I could tell you that now I fully understand p-values, but it's not really the case. And uh, at the time, we didn't have uh, Wikipedia. Anyway, nowadays, you know, the topic is so confusing that it has its own uh, Wikipedia page on what the p-value is not. So a lot of uh, misunderstandings around the p-values. So I was chatting about the topic earlier with uh, Vincent, who gave a presentation. Uh, so we were kind of uh, preparing the slides before the presentation. And uh, I know he knows a lot about statistics. 
So I asked him, uh, do you know about p-values? And I could, I could tell he's an expert because he didn't answer the question. He says, hmm, I'm a Bayesian. Okay, so let's put it on the slide. So even people who know about statistics, like uh, Vincent, uh, don't really have an answer on what the p-value is about. So let me, let me try to upset the statisticians in the, in the room. Let's see if I can. So the p-value as a kind of basic uh, definition is a probability of observing the results that we get, or more extreme, when the null hypothesis is true. So that's the basic definition of uh, p-values. Remember, it's about probability, not certainty. And uh, what you see in a scientific publication usually is some sort of threshold, which is arbitrary and uh, usually set to uh, 0.05, so p smaller than 0.05. Other fields might have uh, different uh, standards, um, but what you see more often is 0 0.05. It means one out of 20, right? That's the idea. So essentially, can we afford to be fooled by randomness every one time out of 20? That's the idea behind the p-values. Connected to the notion of p-values, uh, there's an idea called uh, data dredging. So dredging is dredging in kind of real life, kind of fishing. Uh, and in fact, data dredging is also called data phishing or uh, p-hacking, uh, to say that we're trying to hack the p-values. So what's going on with data dredging? Essentially, the uh, conventional way of, doing, of uh, going about it, you, know, you formulate some hypothesis, you collect data, and then you either prove or disprove your hypothesis. In uh, data dredging, you kind of go the other way around. So you have your data, and you look for patterns until uh, something uh, interesting and statistically significant comes up. So you kind of build your hypothesis in retrospective. So looking for patterns in your data, you know, it's fine, exploratory analysis, uh, so you can uh, sort of understand more about your data set, that's totally fine, but testing your hypothesis on the same data set, that's typically wrong. And that's what data dredging is about. Often is, uh, it's uh, quite easy to spot, um, sometimes, uh, it gets through and uh, you see publications where you might feel like they were going for some fishing, but uh, you're not really sure. So uh, wrapping up, uh, we have seen a lot of examples in uh, different directions where uh, essentially you can uh, use statistics to push your kind of agenda and it feels like, uh, well, we can't really trust anybody. Uh, well, the purpose of the talk was not to uh, create and prepare the next generation of uh, conspiracy theorists. The purpose was simply to you know, remind you uh, there's a big difference between uh, big uh, headlines from the media and uh, you know, proper science. And uh, anyway, this is something that uh, can affect everybody, so nobody is really immune. So even if you are in good faith, from time to time you stumble upon uh, um, these problems and uh, you might uh, kind of introduce your own bias. So the point is always try to ask uh, questions in particular, you know, what is the bigger context? Uh, if you're observing something about a study, you know, who's uh, paying for the study? Is there anything that is missing at all? What is the bigger picture? And long story short, the, you know, the best question would be, so what? You observe some data, you observe some numbers, so what, is, what are the connections? What are we trying to describe here? Is there anything that we don't see? And so on. So that's the summary of it. Uh, that's essentially closing the presentation. The slides are on the speaker deck. They will be around on the, um, the conference app, on Twitter, usual things, and uh, more links if you want to know uh, what I do. And uh, just to uh, plug uh, quickly PyData London, I'm one of the organizers of uh, PyData London, so there was mentioned this morning uh, PyData London, so yeah, you will find me there and you can ask me about PyData London or other PyData chapters around the world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marco. We've got time for a couple of questions. If anyone has any questions, brilliant. So hi, thank you for the talk, it was very nice. Uh, I didn't quite get why data dredging is bad. I mean, I understand that if I have a hypothesis and I try one data set, it doesn't work, so I can try the next data set. Okay, that is bad, I can, I can understand that. But if I have a very big data set and I just look for interesting patterns, 
and a fine one. Why is it, why is it bad looking further into that? So looking for patterns is fine. In fact, that's, that's what we do with a new data set. So in, during exploratory analysis, you kind of look for patterns. The problem is when uh, you, um, you kind of uh, assess your hypothesis on, on the same uh, data. So you, you do it in retrospective. It's kind of cheating. Imagine if you, you know, coming from a machine learning background. In, in my case, imagine I do training and testing on the same data set. It's kind of similar. It's like cheating, basically. But looking for patterns is, uh, is totally fine. You just shouldn't uh, validate your hypothesis uh, in, in that way. OK, thank you for the presentation. And you said what are lies, but then what is true and how to spot the proper analysis? Yeah, I think we, we need a lot of time uh, to, <laughs> to discuss what is true and what is not. And uh, it's a bit of a philosophical question, I guess. The, the title of the talk is, is taken from you know famous expression. Um, yeah, that's the problem. There are, there are uh, facts and there are lies, but sometimes there are facts that are presented in a way that is clearly pushing some kind of agenda. Um, and uh, I guess the message is you need to be prepared for it, right? You, I'm not saying that everything is fake, right? Sometimes things are kind of uh, representing reality just in a way that is uh, packaged for, for you to kind of uh, go in some particular direction. Um, it's difficult to break down, uh, uh, when you get something from the news, it's difficult to break down uh, reality into smaller chunks uh, to fully understand whether things are really lies or, or, or facts. Uh, Still, you know, if you want to be a good citizen, you should make an effort. That's, that's just the message. But I totally agree. You know, it's a, it's a deep philosophical question, and uh, I guess we need a couple of beers to to approach the conversation. All right. Any other questions? We've got time for maybe one more if anyone's interested. All right. In that case, thank you very much, Marco. Thank you.